Welcome back to the LMU History Department's Summer Web Social Media Series, Viral Histories. Viral Histories is an online version of our regular History in the Headlines events, a series of conversations about a variety of issues related to health and disease in response to the current COVID situation. For today's episode, Wet Markets, Wildlife and Wellness, Perspectives from China, I'm joined by my colleague, Professor Meng Zhang, a historian of modern China with a focus on environmental and economic history. Her fascinating study of the timber trade in China, sustaining the market, long distance timber trade in China, 1700 to 1930, will be published by the University of Washington Press in 2021. Thanks for joining me today, Meng. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, so uh, with the initial outbreak of COVID-19 in China, scientists trace back the possible source um, of the virus to a wet market in Wuhan. Now, and we know that this is still a hypothesis, that it hasn't been confirmed to this day. But if you look at global media accounts, they've sort of run with it, right? And global media accounts of China's wet markets have themselves gone viral. What is and is not a wet market? Tell us about them. Yeah, so this is actually something that I had some trouble thinking about, right? What exactly is a wet market? Um, the outbreak of the COVID-19 is actually literally the first time I've heard the term wet market. Um, and I thought it's just another English term that I, I didn't know. You know, I mean, you probably can relate to this. So when you learn a second language for work and academic writing, you will know the abstract terms first before you know the daily terms for, you know, vegetables and utensils. Um, so I thought it's just one of those occasions, right? So of course I followed the news in Chinese and I knew um, the Wuhan market in question was a seafood market for wholesale. So for a time, I just thought, you know, wet market was just the English term for uh, seafood market. And then, of course, after a while, uh, from media, de media depictions of the so-called traditional Chinese wet market, I realized it's not just seafood market, but it could be you know, this enormous variety of different kinds of market that in Chinese, there is actually, there, there is no corresponding term uh, for wet market exactly. Um, and uh, the term wet market, after some digging, I found out that it originated in Hong Kong and Singapore English um, to distinguish markets that sell fresh meat and produce from dry markets, right, that sell um, durable goods like uh, textiles and, and so forth, right? So um, basically a, a wet market is just that place that you go to get fresh, uh, unpackaged, perishable good from small vendors. So when I get that understanding, then my personal reference is just, you know, from my hometown in, in North China, um, there is an early morning market every day from like 5 to eight, 7 or 8 a.m. Um, so I'm going to just share uh, a picture that um, I asked my mother to take just this morning, right, from this morning, early morning market. Um, so, you know, this is mostly they sell vegetables and there are some stands for meat. If you can get up early in the morning, um, you can go there and get cheap, cheaper, fresher goods from, from there. If you cannot get up that early, then you know, you're doomed for the normal grocery sh shopping in the supermarket, right? Um, and no, there is no wild meat for sale here. So for, for, for me, this is just a farmer's market, right? Um, but then apparently, you know, farmer's market is too good a term to be given to the chaotic Chinese markets. Uh, instead, these are wet markets. And I think we, we need to be mindful of how different terms just invoke different um, uh, imaginations in our mind, right? Uh, so, you know, when we say wet market, it is sort of a chaotic Asian thing. But when we say farmer's market, it's sort of this uh, romanticized, uh, you know, weekend uh, 
going out right with families and so forth it's so beautiful and um get closer to to the farmers and so forth right um so that is something that i, I think we need to be mindful of i i i a hundred percent understand what you're talking about with the second language thing and just figuring it's a word you don't know i have had that so many times with with german and polish um and i've also i mean now that you talk about it being at this term wet market is coming from the hong kong and singapore context it, it sort of makes perfect sense right given a, a kind of a, a british imperial imagination so how does the imagination of this specific kind of commercial site figure into how we are talking now about the COVID-19 pandemic? Mm -hmm. um, so in the media, we, we have seen a lot of narratives uh, where wet markets are portrayed as, um, you know, uh, the, the emblem of Chinese otherness, right? The chaotic versions of uh, an oriental bazaar, a lawless, place where animals that should not be eaten are sold as food and so forth. Um, so this, you know, imagined dark, messy side and the, the, the exotic eating habits of the Chinese people have become a ready target for criticism, right, for causing the pandemic. And the rationale goes um, that, you know, if, if only we could just enforce uh, hygienic conditions in the Chinese markets, if only we can get rid of uh, the wildlife consumption, eradicate the customary diet uh, of uh, bats and pangolins, then we should be fine. Um, I am all for uh, the efforts at uh, shutting down wildlife trade and consumption in China, but um, also there is a big difference between just regular wet market and wildlife market, right? Uh, because most of the wet markets actually don't offer um, wild meat or live animals. Um, and this imagination of some sort of traditional Chinese market is also uh, off. It's not so uh, probably in places uh, outside of mainland Chinese, Chinese communities in Hong Kong or Taiwan, um, in Singapore, uh, it, it is, you can trace this um, continuity, right? Trace it to something traditional. But um, really, in mainland China, oh, people tend to forget that this is something new. Um, because in the socialist period, so before China's reform and open up in 1978, before, before that, during the socialist period, there is no private lender. Right? You, you have the ration coupons. You go to a state-owned store to buy stuff. Um, so it is only after the basic grain production was sufficient enough to feed one billion Chinese people in the 1980s did Chinese people's diet uh, really began to diversify, right? So eating a big variety of vegetables, a big variety of meat is a very recent um, achievement. So it, it is in the 1990s that, um, uh, so at the time there was no big supermarket chain, uh, refrigerator was still a luxury. So wet markets started to emerge here and there in the urban neighborhoods, uh, and these vendors are farmers or petty merchants, right? They, you know, they might not look very clean, but these are the truly sort of farm to table farmer's market, right? Not some sort of roman romanticized version of it. Uh, in the 2000s, so just uh, two decades ago, supermarkets only then started to become more common. And wet markets themselves also became more regularized. Uh, so they have designated places. Um, sometimes there, there will be permanent buildings. Uh, if not, then there is a set time. For example, in my hometown, in my case, um, there is a set time during the day, right? You can only go there in the very early morning uh, where people go for cheaper, fresher um, foods. Um, so China now, of course, is, you know, uh, is now seen as a big economic power. Uh, we know that the U.S. is uh, even trying to deny China's status as a developing country. But China's, um, you know, per capita household uh, expenditure is only 
about 15% uh, of the level here in the United States is far below countries that we usually think of as developing countries like Mexico or Brazil or uh, uh, Egypt, you name it. Right? So um, that is say, you know, Sometimes you know there are some petitions to get rid of wet markets in China altogether, um, and uh, outside observers could say you know uh, they might take for granted that oh certainly they can just close all the wet markets and just go to Whole Foods or Costco or whatever their Chinese equivalents to do grocery shopping, um, but it's not. Is no, it's not that simple, right? Small people's livelihood are at stake here, and the vast majority of them are not engaged in any type of wildlife traffic. Um, and yeah. So you've you've you mentioned um, wildlife consumption. I mean, I think also that this is a very important history that you're giving us about the development of these sorts of of markets of farmers, the equivalent of farmers markets, you know. And but you also mentioned wildlife uh, consumption, and it it does seem that part of the current fixation um, on these wet markets has to do with discussions about the morality of eating certain types of things, and it's gotten very polarized. Um, are there historical precedents where Chinese food choices and dietary practices have become such a, a politicized topic? Yes. Um, I think what really uh, strikes me in the, in the recent discussion is how old some of these um, tropes are. Um, so there, you know, what, what, what we hear recently is not that different from much older stories that have been told about uh, Chinese food um, since, the, since the beginning of the 19th century. Um, so in the early 19th century, um, when Western missionaries started to um, write more detailed accounts about um, daily life uh, in China, there is a particular fixation on um, Chinese eating habits, particularly um, the kinds of meat that Chinese people uh, eat. Um, so one comment that became really popular is uh, from a Christian missionary, uh, Walter Methurst, in the early 19th century. Um, his book, China, Its State and Prospects, became sort of a well-read introductory account of Chinese society at the time. And he made the remark that the Chinese had unscrupulous stomachs, right? So they would eat everything from everything. Um, actually, he also include all sorts of unheard of vegetables as examples, right? For, for you know, uh, what the, the exotic things that Chinese people eat. But the focus is really on the kind of um, meat, right? Exotic meat that, um, that is unfamiliar and repulsive, right? That is the central theme. Um, in the Western writing about Chinese diet ever since. So, but, but the key thing is that um, what they eat is not just what they eat, right? But, but the diet choices became this index of uh, the Chinese people's moral character, right? That uh, unselective, unscrupulous stomach then became this symbol um, and it is equated with the lack of moral principle, right? So the, the two is often um, talked about in the, uh, in, the same, in the same vein, to the extent that uh, imaginations and criticisms of what Chinese people eat then directly became a criticism of uh, their morality. Mm -hmm. That, that's so, I mean, that's so interesting. And, and you still see, I think, some of that exoticization uh, today in terms of um, Western tourists going even to things like the night markets, right? And, and um, how they talk about uh, uh, Chinese food practices. Um, so oh, you, and you, if I can just uh, jump in here. Mm -hmm. So in the uh, recent media reports, what really troubles me is also the very irresponsible use of uh, pictures, right? So you can, you, you see this montage of different images that are taken at different times, different places, uh, with different focus. And um, 
uh, they are curated to tell the story of, um, again, that unscrupulous stomach of the Chinese people. Uh, let me just uh, uh, quickly again share um, my screen. Right, so this is, like, for example, in this one, um, a report from Business Insider, right? It tells uh, the report that China banned the trade and consumption of wild animals. And in the images used in this report, um, first you see, you know, the chaotic marketplace and um, unpackaged meat, crowded um, gatherings. That, that, that's not problematic, right? It's just not familiar right but that's not the problem that's not the part of the problem that we're trying to talk about the trade of wildlife but in the middle of it you see this horrific picture where you know there's a vendor sells uh, bats as meat um so all together they provide this um imagination that all of these things are going on in all and every chinese wet market only when you zoom in you find Oh wait a minute! Uh, this picture about uh, bats is from is not in China. It's uh, from Indonesia, uh, and I'm not saying that every market in Indonesia is doing this either. Uh, actually, if you search on the web for pictures of you know the sale of bats as meat, almost all of them come from this one single market in Sulawesi, Indonesia, and it's not a national Indonesia thing. And similarly, uh, in this one, this is, this is one uh, petition on change. There are actually several ongoing petitions on change.org calling for the closure of wet markets in China. And uh, here you see this um, uh, collection of pictures, you know, the sale of some exotic monkey and the sale of bats. There is no indication of the source of the image, the time and place are all missing. But um, once you do some cross-reference, you see that all of these images are from one report about that said market in uh, Indonesia. Um, and, you know, so these are the type of things that we really need to be careful uh, about. Uh, we all know the power of pictures to tell a story and we also need to be mindful of how they might be manipulated. And that's one of the things that we put so much stress on, obviously, in our history courses is on, on taking a critical approach to um, the sources of our information and really tracking down where that information comes from. You know, you've, you've talked a lot about the, the stereotypes, the, the misperceptions, the, the, the sort of um, tropes uh, uh, and, and um, around the Chinese diet or Chinese diet practices around traditional Chinese medicine and their associations with wildlife consumption. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what is the pattern of wildlife consumption uh, in China? How does it fit in with ideas about wellness? What does that look like from a historical perspective? I think we, we need a little bit more of that unpacking of these myths um, and stereotypes that have emerged. Yes, um, I think, so both in China and elsewhere, I think wildlife consumption and um, uh, the conservationist or preservationist advocacy against it are all historical processes, right? So uh, for now, we, we can say that the involvement of such processes in China is not exactly synchronized with that in the United States or the West in general um, to the decade level, right? Um, but, you know, there's no reason to believe that the whole world should be synchronous to that minute level, right? But if we zoom out and uh, begin to see things at the magnitude of centuries, then the picture, big, big picture is actually similar to think about um, consumption and the movement against certain consumptions from the early modern period to the present. Um, so I think even for the earnest, um, conservationist, right? Um, wildlife consumption per se, the action per se, is not problematic in all situations and in all time period, right? You know, I don't think anybody would go back to 
thousands of years ago and go tell a hunter gatherer that you know you should not go hunt and eat that wildlife. Uh, what is the target of our criticism and concern is the consumption of wildlife as an exotic luxury, luxury right for the good tastes of it or for some purpose that modern science considers ridiculous like traditional chinese medicine right and especially when you um, make such consumptions at the cost of biodiversity and with public health risks uh, from zoonotic diseases right that's the context in which we really want to um, restrict the traffic and consumption of uh, wildlife. And these types of luxurious exotic consumptions uh, of uh, wild um, plants and animals beyond just a narrow top elite class uh, is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, in China, right? It only started to take off again with China's recent economic development with um, the unprecedented emergence of an affluent urban middle class at the turn of the 21st century. And there are big regional um, differences. So such practices were, are certainly more prevalent in the South than in the North. Um, Historically, uh, if we think about the spread of certain consumption uh, from the, the elite class to the commoners, um, a lot of commodities actually come to mind, right? Uh, including tea and uh, so forth. Uh, but of course, the spread of tea is not that problematic. If you can grow tea trees instead of opium, that's a win-win, right? Uh, that's good uh, for uh, a lot of reasons. But uh, other, the spread of other uh, commodities uh, from the elite class to a more broad uh, common basis it could cause problems, right? For uh, in, in this case, uh, the growing uh, sector of the Chinese society who can afford uh, these type of exotic goods and, and whose desire for it is uh, sort of adding fuel to, to the traffic and trade of wildlife. That's the problem that we are really concerned about. And um, not to downplay this problem, but again, this is a very recent uh, development. So this rise of an impetuous consumerism in the recent decades uh, in China has already um, caused um, a wave of environmentally concerned groups in China, right? It caused them to criticize, criticize, uh, criticize such behaviors and calling for more uh, regulation uh, for it. Um, international pressure, government regulations are all uh, helpful, uh, but still ultimately it takes some time to change people's attitude because, you know, if you think about it, uh, the, the people who in the early 21st century are um, showing off their new wealth, you know, buying these uh, exotic goods are exactly the same generation who in their youth have suffered through China's great famine in the 60s. Um, and many of them in the South, uh, they survived that famine by, you know, hunting in the forest and get whatever they can eat. Um, you know, it takes some time for uh, attitude change and with the new generation coming up, uh, certainly we, we are hopeful to that change will happen. Uh, just probably not this year or next year, but you know, decade, I'm pretty positive. It's really interesting because, you know, so much of this discussion um, also touches on your, your next big project, um, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's about the, the making and circulation and then consumption of edible bird's nests, um, both for health benefits, but also then to get at this issue of a luxury good and a delicacy for elites. Can you talk a little bit more about this project? I mean, I find it so fascinating. I, I, I want everybody else to hear about it, too. Yeah, I'm glad you include this question. Um, so this is precisely one example of an early modern elite consumption that just in recent decades has become a popular item among the new urban middle class, right? And um, 
that expansion of demand uh, has uh, ecological repercussions beyond China's borders because this is an international uh, trade network. Um, so edible bird's nest is from the saliva of hardened saliva of certain species of swiftlets. Um, so some of them are in China, but most of them are in Southeast Asia. And contrary to popular tales and what you might hear from contemporary uh, commercials, this is actually not something that had been used in Chinese medicine from time immemorial or the age of sage kings who tested all the kinds of uh, medicines and decided which are beneficial to the human uh, beings. Uh, that, that didn't happen thousands of years ago, right? Actually, um, uh, edible bird's nest was not even recorded in the most of authoritative canonical pharmacopoeia of the late 16th century. Uh, so it's a pretty latecomer to the whole game of traditional Chinese medicine. And at that time in the late 16th century, it was only starting to show up on Chinese shores as an exotic good brought back by the merchants and sailors who traded in Southeast Asia. Um, that is to say, it is not a given that edible bird's nest should become popular among Chinese elites, let alone to be used as medicine. So a whole lot of knowledge had to be invented to testify to its nutritional and medicinal benefits. And those kind of knowledge production also are bonded with the effective targeted uh, marketing. So for me, this is really one episode um, at the inter intersection of early modern global capitalism together with early modern environmental um, history. Um, so with the expansion of the Chinese demand, and mind you, until this day, this is still a peculiar Chinese demand. Only people in China and ethnic Chinese communities outside of China desire it. Uh, in the early modern period, uh, merchants from China and Southeast Asia and also Europeans uh, the, particularly the, the Dutch East Indian Company, endeavored to make profit out of it. And local communities in today's uh, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia came up with new ways to manage access to those caves where the swiftlets uh, laid their nests. Right? Um, before, nobody was paying attention to the, who, who cared about <laughs> the caves in the mountains, but now it has become such a hot commodity that uh, the local communities have to come up with ways to regulate uh, who should have access, right? What is the ownership? Um, and how do we regulate harvesting to at least uh, keep the harvesting at, some, at a somewhat sustainable um, level, right? These are all new um, development at the time. And more recently, um, as I mentioned, with the explosion of Chinese demand, uh, when uh, the new urban middle class came to the game, um, so the level of demand has grown so sharply compared to what a small elite class in the early modern time could consume, right? So this new development uh, is again um, threatening the swiftlet population nowadays in, in Southeast Asia and also led to some controversial new moves. For example, the attempt at domesticating the swiftlets. Uh, that, that, that is ongoing, right? It's going on uh, right now. So um, I'm just starting this new project, but I'm really fascinated by these questions about the interactions between uh, some sort of um, epistemological innovation, uh, global capitalism, and their environmental impacts. Yeah, and there's, I mean, even beyond that, there are issues of uh, in, even international relations at some level too, and regional dynamics. I mean, there's just so much packed into edible birds' nests, and and whoever would have thought that in these these tiny little birds and that and their saliva, we could get so much really. Um, great historical questions out of it. 
So to, as a final question to wrap up, can you tell us if the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed attitudes about any of these things in China? Have there been measures to restrict wildlife trade to protect endangered species? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, indeed. I think each outbreak of a uh, zoonotic disease certainly provides an impetus for some um, collective reflection on what we consume, what we eat. Um, and it also helps to clear the way, clear the obstacle for more restri restrictive uh, regulation. Right? So the, the last one was the uh, 2003 SARS outbreak and in the aftermath of that, China banned um, wet markets across China from holding wildlife. Um, and then um, uh, just more recently in February, the Chinese government announced a ban on the sale of wild animal products at wet markets. So these are clearly, you know, very encouraging signs. Um, and I'm also confident that the consumption of wildlife for food would definitely dwindle down in the near future with people's attitudes change, more effective regulation. Uh, and, as, and as I mentioned, the, young, the younger generation coming up, uh, definitely millennials are more uh, conscious about environmental issues. Um, but I'm less certain for consumptions related to traditional Chinese medicine. Um, th this will get us to a whole different realm about you know, what is science, what is what can be scientifically proven and how even scientific minded people can justifiably retain certain beliefs that the current science methodologies have yet been able to give a definite answer to. So um, I think that is difficult. It's not like, you know, average Chinese person will consume traditional Chinese medicine on a daily basis. It is usually when you get desperate, right? When existing med medical treatment cannot cure you, you just uh, try whatever is available. It was really in those situations that people turn to uh, traditional Chinese medicine and by that turn to some um, exotic animal parts involved in that. Uh, so, you know, even that is to say, even for people who in normal times have high confidence in modern medicine, there might be that moment of desperation, right? Um, so I think that is um, uh, something that I don't see, uh, you know, regulations certainly help, right? But I couldn't solve the whole problem without uh, a changing attitude. Um, and I think, you know, um, when I have discussion with uh, friends and colleagues uh, and students, um, here in the United States. I think some people have this fancy imagination of an all-powerful authoritarian communist government that could do anything, right? If you can have a one-child policy, if you could have this great firewall on the internet, certainly you can use that power to do something good and eradicate uh, wildlife um, traffic and its use in medicine. Um, but it really doesn't work that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, for good or for bad. Um, I think a, a not so perfect analogy will be, um, you know, the gun, gun control problem in the, in the United States. For outside observers uh, like myself, I, you know, it's, it's puzzling why a powerful government like the United States could not do something about this when other countries have uh, done so much. Um, but then, you know, when you dig, dig deeper into it, uh, you see all these different interests and people's priorities come into play. Um, it, you know, there, is, there are some similarities between these two issues, right? So um, I think we wish certainly advocate for positive changes, spread the message and, and do what we can do. But my point is that just creating an essentialized Chinese otherness is not the way to do it. And, and that's a very important lesson from, from all of this, that um, we need to fight against those sorts of um, 
exoticizing tendencies that have so structured past understandings of, of China. Well, thank you so much, Meng, for this really very interesting discussion. And I'm so looking forward to both to your book and to the Bird's Nest Project. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Uh, things will be a little bit different next week when I will be doing a live webinar um, about documenting the history of COVID on Monday the 27th at noon as part of the BCLA Liberal Arts in Action, Art, Liberal, Liberal Arts in Action series. Uh, you can register for that at bellarmine.lmu.edu slash LA action. Uh, I hope to see you there and please bring with you or have in mind some sort of artifact that will help future historians tell the history of this moment in time. Thanks again, Monk. Thank you.